this is my studio. It's my my little workshop. Um, I'm just kind of uh, I had a writing session today with uh, uh, Alista Griffith and Jeff Cohen. Okay. And um, yeah, I had a new song with her that's just coming coming out. I think it's called Clean, and she's the indie artist, uh, kind of alt country. Not full on country. Everything seems to be country. Yeah, yeah, no yeah. What. What's her last name? Sorry, Alista Griffith. Griffith, like Andy Griffith. Alice, yeah. Uh, Alyssa, yeah, Alyssa. Uh, yeah, and it's on Empire is the label. Yeah, uh, oh, I see. Called Clean. Yeah, but uh, so we're writing some more songs, and I've got this buddy Jeff Cohen, who is a really <laughs> awesome writer uh, that um, I went on this UK writing trip with him last year, almost at this time, right before COVID. And we had a really great time, um, played a gig there, did a songwriters in the round thing, which he's, he holds a lot of the, the Bluebird Cafe songwriters in the round, or he okay. did until yeah. just, you know. Sure. And now that stuff is probably going to be coming back. So, um, so anyways, we went over and wrote with a few artists, and then we did a songwriter in the round at this place called the Roundhouse, and uh, that was fun. That was really a blast playing to a UK audience, and yeah. it was it was like a college crowd, and I was thinking like dang you know like i'm an old dude is anyone gonna does anyone know these songs i'm gonna be playing you know or is yeah. it gonna be complete silence you know and i was uh really pleasantly surprised people singing along you know so it was really a heartwarming experience for me well so, i think isn't that one of the um one of the pleasant maybe unintended consequences of the streaming world is that if somebody hears a song um, and they dig it for whatever reason, they can immediately go and say, oh, um, I need to go down a little bit of a rabbit hole over here. I'm gonna go see what else this guy has. And there you go. There's just a list of music that they've you know, previously undiscovered. And now they've got new stuff to listen to for a while. And I'm not sure that, that anybody who, who uh, I know it was all very scary at the beginning with uh, Napster and all that stuff, but here's um, a, an unintended consequence that might really pay off for some people. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's a it's a wonderful thing. I mean, it's, you know, the double edged sword. It's, you know, not not as great for the creators in 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 monetary sense. But, you know, as far as, you know, the reach of what it has, you know, somebody in Botswana or someplace yeah. might yeah. hear, you know, the last track on an album that I made or something, you know. Um, so it is pretty cool. And And I have I have a couple of sons who are into music i've got a 19 year old and a 14 or just turned 15 yesterday actually. wow look at you that's awesome yeah and he he you know originally from the hip-hop scene like that's his music is hip-hop but then he kind of looked up you know who does kid cuddy listen to okay yeah. who does jay-z who does kanye west you know uh all those and and then he goes down the rabbit hole and he goes, oh, they were influenced by Herbie Hancock and like these old jazz guys and stuff. So that's where you find that like the adventure that you go on that is music, you know, usually starting with your early, you know, experiences. And now I'm watching him like, hey, have you ever heard of this guy or or this or that? And then I'll play, he'll play me something that maybe like Thundercat did with Michael McDonald or something like that. I go, well, hey, have you heard the the original of that? And you know, because they're always stealing stuff from like Steely Dan and stuff like that, and looping it and creating like a hip hop track, which is awesome. That's what music should be like this lineage or something. So your, your kids are making music. Well, they um, yeah. Well, they my uh, nineteen year old was did. Um, he was in string ensemble, so he went the classical route. Now he's in college. He stopped doing the music thing. His um, just you know after the 
his last year of high school but now he's now that he's going to college he's kind of returned to like hey there's this thing that i used to really enjoy yeah um instead of just focusing on your major you got to have some other outlet besides just academics you know or whatever it is um and then same with my son my 15 year old son griffin he um he you know hey show me can i show me how to play a chord or something like that and now he's like playing these cool jazz chords on piano with like very little um uh piano lessons or anything like just from you know youtube this is yeah. how you play this song or whatever so wow i've got i've got two boys as well. they're a little younger 11 and uh and eight so i'm a, a little bit behind you there but they both really really like music um the the <laughs> The troubling thing, we're, we're still in lock. I'm in Toronto and um, oh. we're in like we're in a serious lockdown here still. So the kids are doing virtual schooling and um, we're, you know, just stuck at home. But we've got the uh, the Amazon Alexis dotted around in everybody's bedroom and stuff. And um, my eight year old, while he's crushing Fortnite, is also listening to him <laughs> is, is, is also list and, you know, and, and socializing with his friends while he's doing it, which is great. But he's also he loves hip hop and I haven't yet been able to find a filter on Alexa that will um, allow him to, uh, you, you know what I'm talking about, listen to hip hop songs that don't constantly drop words that I would rather not hear coming out of. Yeah. 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 It's, it's, unfortunately it's, it's, for that genre, it's almost unavoidable. And, it and, and I've got a, I've got a little thing to, you know, to let you know, like, okay, when my, when my, boy was 10 um and we were we're in nashville now but we were living in la for for quite a while and uh and so i'm a, men, a member of sag screen actors guild yep. and every year you know i get the stack of dvds of you know to be considered because i can vote for you know um movies that are up for oscars or golden globes or whatever and so I get the stack of them, you know, and they're all like vying for you to vote for them. So that for your consideration, yeah. for your consideration, yeah, exactly. And we we call them, we call them screeners or whatever. It's a, you know, yeah. So so we found the. You know, I lost you there for a sec, Jeff. Through them and then. So so you know. So my son went through these DVDs and he looks at this one DVD and he goes, hey, dad, uh, you want to watch this movie? It's about Compton. It's called Straight Out of Compton. <laughs> and I'm like, and he goes, you know, that's pretty close to us, right? And I say, yeah, well, it's not too far away. And, and he goes, I it's, really want to see it's this. Literally, it's literally very close, but figuratively worlds away. Really far. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And uh, so, you know, I, you know, hey, can we watch it? And I, you know, knowing what it might be about and, you know, without having seen it, but just, you know, I, and it's not like I don't shelter my kids, but, you know, you want to, you want to be aware and supervise them and do the right thing. Yeah. And, and so, uh, you know, so I watched a little bit of it and then before, you know, saying yes or no, and then I was like, well, you know, there's there's some very, you know, there's a lot of sexual uh, content and there's some violence and, you know, I'm not sure if you're ready for this. And, you know, and here's a kid who's like playing Grand Theft Auto, right? And I'm telling him this, right? I know. But then, and then I thought, well, okay, this is one of those moments. Uh, it is about music and, you know, and it is about where we live and all this stuff. So I made a deal with them after he was urging me over and over and over and over and over again to watch it. I relented and I, I just said, well, okay, I'll watch it with you. But if there's a scene that I think is inappropriate for you, I'm going to cover your eyes yep. and, you know, and I'm going to, I'm going to mute it and I'm going to be on guard because I'm your dad and, you know, I'm just trying to guide I do do this. Okay, cool. You know, so he's sitting there and it's just like every second I'm like muting it, covering <laughs> his eyes, you know, like it was crazy. Yeah. yeah. But we but we made it, we went, got through the whole movie, 
And then afterwards, you know, just feeling so guilty, like, wow, you know, my wife is going to kill me after she hears <laughs> what I've done. Yeah. And then uh, I said, well, what, you know, what did you get from that, you know, uh, highly entertaining movie? Well, you know, these people have, you know, living in a rough neighborhood and the only way they could get out of the living there and being, you know, beaten up by police and all this stuff is by doing music and creating music so that that will get them away from their troubles, you know? And I was like, okay. dude, that was so worth watching, you know? Yeah. So, so I kind of figured out, all right, well, you know, and kids these age, I mean, I'm probably pretty sure you're even your kids at their age, they know more than you think they know, you I know? know. <laughs> I know. So <laughs> I know, I know. We just all got to cross our fingers and hope, you know, it, it, you 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 had me thinking about um you know the, 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 we just have to teach them that if when they're driving if you're cranking some music particular kind of music maybe make sure that the windows are up because you know <laughs> you know what i'm talking about that scene that has been in a bunch of movies where the white kid pulls up listening to hip hop and the windows are down and they look over and there's some guys who are just going really with that so i mean i also look the, the kids also know you know if i put sinatra on they know who frank sinatra is and we there's jazz going on and 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 uh, uh, there's other kinds of music but when they are by themselves and they can just say to alexa who they want to listen to they're not listening to the smiths they're not listening to uh <laughs> they're not listening to frank zappa they're listening to bands that or, or artists that i haven't heard of and uh it's uh, it seems to be where they where they gravitate right now because it is it's it's youth culture right that is hip-hop is youth culture right now it is totally you know and it's it's like that that's the most sort of recent new music form that i can think of you know and basketball um, is, is is like the number one sport and everybody's saying that's part of the culture it is yeah and everything too so a couple little pasty white kids from Toronto. I'm just like, okay, guys, you can, <laughs> you can totally support this. And it's really good that you do. Um, but just here are some caveats that we have to make sure that we put in place. Totally. Yeah. That's that, that, that's it. I mean, I, I think it's just good to be conscientious, I guess, you know, you, you know, you know how it is. Like sometimes you just, you know, you try to do the right thing. You might say the wrong word it wrong or, or yeah. frame it wrong. And, and then, but I, I try to be pretty, pretty honest and straightforward with them as much as I can. Yeah. And knowing that, you know, in some ways I'd rather them get their peek into the world through me first, at least yeah. I can be that first barrier before they are actually out in the world. Yeah. yeah so. That's, that sounds a lot like what my parents said to me, Jeff, when I was a kid, they're like, if, <laughs> if, if you want to try marijuana, let's do it at home first. <laughs> Yeah, like you're really going to do that uh, with them, right? <laughs> I don't think that's going to happen. Um, um, uh, it's, are, your, are, you, uh, are your kids going to pursue music as a career, do you think? Well, the, my older son, is um, he's, he's pursuing uh, aviation. He's getting, yes. he's, he's getting his uh, private pilot's license uh sometime this year when he gets enough solo flights and then and then he's going to go he's going to start doing lab they call it lab or whatever uh you know learning how to fly commercial jets and stuff like that so i think you know in his mind he this is where he wants to go you know you know might be flying freight from here to wherever yeah, the uk with for sure yeah yeah, so you can do that, or you could do passenger, or many different things, or even just be, you know, fly small commuter planes or whatever. So he's totally into that, and he could um, be he could be in the music business by flying a private jet for Alan Jackson or something. Exactly, you know. So I think it's a wonderful thing. Yeah, he's very technical. He's kind of a math whiz, so he likes all the he likes all the numbers and you know everything so you're very lucky that's very you're very fortunate that's amazing yeah the younger my younger son is um he's a hockey player you'll probably be pleased being from toronto i'm sure you're everybody you know, I, every I, canadian I, I, is into hockey i grew up in, in canada um i was born in scotland so uh, hockey um has definitely been impossible to avoid 
I have uh, I have recently unsubscribed because the Toronto Maple Leafs lost to the Boston uh, uh, Bruins um, in Game Seven for the third time in a row, and that was a couple uh, years ago. So I'm just like, you know what? I'm out. But yeah. the, the game is it's a beautiful game, so I'm happy your son loves it. I know I know hockey's big in Nashville. It really it's yeah. it's crazy. I would have never thought that it would be, and um, and it's wonderful, especially this area. You know, having the Predators and then they've been really involved in, the, you know, the youth programs and stuff like that. And my son, my son is in the ball or baseball, football or anything like that. But he, he's been skiing and skating and stuff since he was like two. And wow. then and then and then never really got serious about playing hockey until I think about three years ago. We have this, um, my wife and I have this mutual friend who's uh, 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 Justin Williams, who is a, a, a big ice hockey player yeah, for the, nice. for the uh, um, Carolina Hurricanes. And we met them in LA when he was on the Kings. Well, anyways, he has a 10, he's now retired this year and he has a 10 year old son who is a really amazing hockey player. So my son saw his, his son playing a tournament here in Nashville. And then he was like, looking at us like, I want to do that. Uh, and we're awesome. like, Oh my God. So, I mean, you know, he's not looking at like becoming a pro, but you can play hockey until you're, you know, pretty old, you yeah, know, if you can yeah, skate yeah. and stand and walk, yeah. you can, there's men, you know, adult leagues and, you know, senior leagues and the whole bit you could play it your whole life almost so yeah as long as your uh, knees as long as you keep your knees absolutely the knees that's it knees. you know yeah, so yeah, yeah. so he loves that and then he he's interested he's uh he's very interested in um music big i mean big music fan like he wow he's he's really and uh and so i've taught him how to use my studio to create his own music and that's been really nice. And I just, I just say, okay, when I'm done with my writing session or whatever session I have that day, when I'm done, then you can have the studios all yours. Wow. If you need to know how to turn something on or patch something or whatever, and he's just doing it. He's just, you know, he's just doing it on his own, learning how to create beats and melodies and stuff. So. I love that. Um, I love the the proact the proactive nature of that. If I'm interested in that. I'm going to go find out how that works. Not just like wait until you spoon feed them something. It sounds like you've uh, yeah. you've got a couple of very um, inquisitive kids. Good job. Good job, Dad. Yeah. <laughs> Good job, Dad. The least I can do. Yeah, put <laughs> something out into the world that is you know but well, into done, society you you put a lot of good stuff out into the world already i think you've uh you, you've put up look you've written songs that i know every word to um and as i as i delicately segue into uh the reason why uh we're chatting today um it, it's i think you probably know what they want to hear from you this is um uh, it's obviously a treat to get to talk to you a little bit more in depth it's what i love doing but um what what is then what they're going to use for this robert and robin for 97 south is to uh just a, some so, a social media blurb, unfortunately. Uh, that is the, uh, it, we can't put the whole thing up, but they yeah. want, they want oh, I think sure. you know, right, already, a song that you wish, having written uh, as many songs as you've written, a song that, that spoke to you in a way that was a little bit different, that was um, like, oh man, I think that's kind of, that, that feels like me, and I wish I'd written that song, and this is kind of why. These are the boxes it checks for me. I think that's kind of uh, what they were looking for. And they'll cut, well, we got an editor that'll cut this down and, and turn it into 60 seconds. All of this wisdom that we've already shared um, <laughs> will, be, will be cut down into- uh, cut, It'll be, yeah, just put in the waste bin or dustbin, uh, whatever there's. And before, before I forget, I was speaking with Jessica Mitchell earlier uh, today and she wanted me to tell you that she says hello. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, she's she's great. I, I've written a couple of songs with her. You mentioned, yeah. And she's like, oh, you're yeah. talking to Jeff. You got to tell him I said hello. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Hi back. She is. Um, she is. Uh, uh, was just telling me that a lot of the artists that I've spoken to over the last year or so fall into two categories. One, they've really enjoyed the time with family, and they've also enjoyed the time off the road to focus on writing, and they found it very um, a very fruitful time. 
The other side of the fence is um, apathy and lack of inspiration and, uh, and and kind of on that side. And Jessica, unfortunately, falls into the latter. <laughs> well, I think everybody is kind of like, you know, hit those wall, you know, maybe creatively. But, but like the, what it has affected me, uh, well, in some ways it hasn't really changed much of what I do, except that during the whole pandemic, you know, not being able to interact with people uh, in person, yeah. which is way different than doing it. We are, you know, even though this is like, this is a great, great alternative to um, yeah. not being able to be in the same room with yeah. somebody and ex exchange uh, experiences. Um, but being, being kind of like a creative type, um, solitude and, um, you know, having, being, being locked up in a, in a, your cave or whatever you want to call it, um, wasn't as really as challenging as probably other people might handle yeah. it, yeah. you know, um, because I'm kind of, you know, by myself a lot of times. And so I, it was easy for me to adapt. I, I understand yeah. the difference with like an engineer or an editor in the movie business or a television business or whatever are used to spending eight, 10, 12 hours a day in a dark room um, in, on, on a solo mission to achieve something and occasionally collaborating, occasionally coming out for some vitamin D and realizing, yeah, that, yeah and getting this stuff back. So I, I totally understand what you're saying. Yeah, I found it wasn't a far reach for me to just um, do, you know, editing and, and, you know, assembling tracks on my own or even through Zoom. We, and I've done a few, uh, you know, writing sessions through Zoom, which are kind of challenging in that you can't do them the same way as if you're sitting together in real time and your rhythms and phrasing and stuff yeah. are, you know, through Zoom, they're altered. So you're hearing them like, you know, on the and or whatever, it, it, instead of on one or whatever. Right, 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 yeah. You know, so that's a little challenging to hear the melody where the phrasing comes in. But the one really great aspect of it is um, now I can write with like a buddy in London and we'll just do the best we can. And it's usually focused mostly on lyrics and melody. And then, you know, if we could put a track together somehow, uh, then we'll do that. So that's not that's not so bad. Yeah. And um, and certainly, you know, in this isolation period, uh, you know, makes you really look at what things are really important you know, being with your family, um, trying to survive, you know, uh, trying to keep yourself from going crazy and, uh, and all those challenges that, you know, and so I think in some ways I almost locked myself into music even that much more. But one, one, one of the really great things is that um, pre-COVID, our family never eight meals together. I mean, sometimes on birthdays or go to go to dinner or whatever, but hardly ever like, you know, my boys are like, oh, you know, eat at different times. Oh, I got homework and yep. this and that. My wife would be busy doing something or maybe sometimes we'd get together and spend 10 minutes, you know, and then, but during COVID, it was kind of like, well, okay, this is, you know, well, we, almost went back in time where we were like we're making these nice meals spending a little time together uh, and then maybe watching some crappy tv like family feud or something and sitting around yeah. and we're all together yeah. and we're just like and something that i didn't think i'd ever do i ended up doing that and then we're like going every night it was like oh come on the feud we gotta watch yeah. the feud <laughs> and we're spending more time doing this like you know, yeah. crappy, crappy television, having a meal. But then it really did bring us together in the weirdest, the strangest way. Jeff, I'll be so, honest, we've done the game show thing as well. I'm glad to know we're not the only <laughs> ones, honestly. <laughs> yeah, it, it's, you know, probably watching, you know, way too much uh, television and all that stuff. Uh, but, um, 
but I think, you know, having that unity with your family, you know, some, you know, I'm hearing some of my friends are like breaking up or divorcing and all yeah. that stuff and all this. And I think, you know, in our case, we got lucky and it brought us even closer together. And even now that we're not doing like sitting down watching Family Feud because like, okay, we, yeah, we can actually get out in the world. We're still taking the time, you know, to spend time together and explain, you know, hey, you know, things aren't too bad right now, you know. So um, it was a bit of a certainly it was a bit of a reset or a recalibration. Yeah, yeah. I like that. Is when it first happened, nobody on the road. It was so nice. And the air is like, you look up in the sky, there's no smog, it's beautiful and everything's great. It was kind of eerie, like, kind of like, you know, uh, you know, look what, you know, look what happens when you leave the, the planet alone a little bit, it'll, it kind of, you know, heals itself. So without, well, you know, being, you know, tortured, you know, by the I human do. race. I do, I do. <laughs> Um, I don't want to uh, to monopolize any more of your time tonight here. I'm going to let you um, uh, uh, just, uh, do you have a song picked that you're going to use for this? Okay, so I, well, I briefly read, you know, like I read through it and and then it just, it just said like favorite song or something like that. Favorite and I wasn't song. sure what. So the idea is that um, because it's a song, we're, we're highlighting songwriters. The idea is to ask people who have written I mean, I'm, I'm assuming you've written upwards of, a, I don't know, three, four, five thousand songs in your career. So um, it, it, you probably lost track. But uh, the Excel spreadsheet, probably you stopped updating it at some point. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I just, yeah. um, the idea is, is there a song that spoke to you either early in your career or maybe even later in your career when you had uh, firmly established an idea of who you were as a songwriter that really spoke to you, a song that you... I mean, the conceit is a song that you wish you wrote and why you wish you wrote it, just because it maybe checks some boxes for you. Um, there is, there is. And I was pleased to see the email that said like, you know, normally it'd be like favorite song. At first I didn't know whether, you know, you were gonna say like, you know, one of my my favorite songs that, that I've written because like that is that would be like you know who's your favorite son or of course. kid or whatever you know like you can't <laughs> possibly never, think of I would favorite. never ask you that Jeff they're all my favorites <laughs> <laughs> but um yeah I there is one song specifically that comes to mind uh it's a song called um The Killing Moon and it's um by Echo and the Bunnymen and they were like an 80s 90s band and it's a really beautiful song that's maybe the most romantic song that I think I've ever heard. And the melody is very like, um, it has this almost, you know, timeless melody to it. And, uh, and lyrically, you know, there are beautiful metaphors, you know, um, and that would probably be one of the, one of the greatest songs in my life that that you know melodically and lyrically it's very poetic and you know it's that song is really one that i definitely wish that i had written and um you know in my generation and um and one that i i actually try to get cheryl crow to to cover in fact we at soundcheck well when i was still touring in her band in the uh mid to late 90s um we were in the uk we did a lot of like tours in the uk because her second record was very popular over there we did like you know we played albert hall we played like glastonbury festival we did um Wembley Arena, and that was a high point. But uh, while we were touring in the UK, um, you know, I was telling Cheryl, wow, we should play, you know, Killing Moon. And because we're going to be playing in Liverpool, and my favorite band, Echo and the Bunnymen, 
are they are they are from Liverpool, and maybe we could get Ian McCulloch to come out and sing it with you. So so she's really you know good natured. Sure, yeah, let's do that. You know, how does it go? And then I would play you know play it in, and and you know I gave her a tape of it, and back you know when they had tapes <laughs> tape music, and uh, and. Um, She's like, wow, this is a beautiful, it's, you know, a haunting tune and um, yeah, let's do it. So we, during a sound check, you know, before we got to Liverpool, we did all these shows and we would do it, practice it in sound check and we got a pretty good, you know, version of it in our way. And so, you know, somebody had contacted Ian McCulloch to come down as a guest of Cheryl's and um they said oh yeah he'll come down and come down we were all ready to do it and we were going to do it as an encore and the guy never showed up oh no so he never never showed up so i was just i because the other thing that i thought too is that this would maybe inspire her to do a version of it we could record a version and put it out just as a fun b-side or whatever and so and he never arrived, never showed up, nothing, no note, or like, so sorry, I can't make it, I'm too busy, or whatever. So scroll about four years later, I'm living in Portland, Oregon, and, and a friend of mine calls, who is playing drums for Echo and the Bunnymen, and he goes, he goes, hey, Jeffrey, you know, come down, and I know you're a big fan of the band and all that stuff. And I said, sure. So I saw the show, and then afterwards we met, met up with Ian for drinks. And so I, I, you know, I told him about that. I said, gosh, you know, we were gonna cut the song, and you know, how come? And at first I thought, like, you know, oh, you know, she's not good enough to do my song or whatever, you know. And he was just like, I was just mortified. I was just the thought of being on stage with her just terrified me. And I go, but it's your song. You know, you could have, you know, I was like, you know, he just said, hey, you know, I mean, I love her, but I was just too intimidated and just felt like I didn't want to, you know, come off poorly and all that stuff. And I said, well, you could have just said, oh, well, you know, I'll see the show, but I, I don't feel like playing it. Yeah, maybe yeah, maybe, maybe just cool. to let us let us know, maybe, you know, let us know as we're up. waiting there to like, you know, where is he? <laughs> I'm thinking like then you're still trying to get Cheryl to do a cover of the song, and she's like, I'm not covering that song by that asshole who didn't show up. <laughs> That's exactly what it was. Yeah, like I was trying to push her into doing it, and she's like, Really, you want me to do that after you stood us up? Yeah, like, you know, it was more out of my. I, I know she would have done it because she knows that it meant a lot to me. But of yeah. course, you know how cool is that though? That your love of music, something that you were just like a fan of, and just the pure love of, of from that side of it, that you were able to kind of almost make that thing happen just with some connections that you had, and it was uh, um, you would have been ultimately playing. I know it didn't happen, but on stage with it like it came that close on stage with the guy who played this that's pretty cool that's very cool well in in a happy ending kind of way yeah. a little uh um uh, after the the uk thing um back in the 90s uh i was also listening in on the bus as we travel from town to town you know uh after our gigs i used to like to sit in the back lounge and just you know chill out have have you know a smoke or whatever and listen to music just for fun and i was listening to a lot of um like the band and a lot of graham parsons and um uh a lot of emmy lou harris and wow. like wrecking ball and that record and um listening to it and cheryl would come back wow those are really you know those are i forgot how great those songs are and uh, and about oh maybe a month after that uh it, this you know listening to these songs she comes up to me and says hey you're not going to believe who's going to sit in with us 
And I'm thinking like, Ian McCulloch, okay, cool. <laughs> no, Levon Helm is going to come and play Cripple Creek and uh, Dixie and The Wait. And Emmy Lou is going to come up and sing An Evangeline and Hand Jive and all these other songs. And I think Joan Osborne is going to come up and we're going to have like this big, almost like a last waltzy kind of thing. Yeah, I was just thinking that. Yeah, you were painting that yeah. picture. Martin Scorsese, he's going to be there. He's going to shoot it. He's going to shoot it and all that stuff. Well, that actually really did happen. And we played in New York and we we did our set. And then for the encore, we brought those guys out and started playing all these classic songs. Wow. The bus most of the time. And, uh, and then lo and behold, you know, put it out into the universe. Cheryl made it come true, you know, and uh, and here I'm on stage with LaVon Helm and then sharing a microphone with Emmy Lou Harris. Like, I'm mortified. I'm like shaking. Like, oh, my God, it's <laughs> like got this angelic voice and I've got this crappy, you know, whatever gruff voice. So uh, but it was an incredible experience. And uh, so that's that's the happy ending to all that is that. I did listen to some music and we did get to play with some legendary, you know, musicians and yeah. all that. So I love it. Well, I mean, know, I'm, I was but, a fan of Echo and the Bunnymen as well. I'm um, uh, the Smiths were my favorite band growing up. They were my most the, the, the band that I loved the most. Not that I identified with Morrissey. I had no idea what he was singing about when I was 13 years old. Just somehow the music spoke. To me. <laughs> I like I like rainy day stuff. I don't know if you see in the back there. I've got my Oasis plaque up there yeah. um, so uh, like I was a fan of the the and uh, joy division and um, the cure and um, uh, I tears for fears as well I know you played with tears for fears when I, I saw did that. I like yeah. damn let's yeah. go that's incredible I mean there's some serious musicianship there and um, so I'm I'm a fan of that era and that time as well it's a good yeah good it's a special time it was like a very you know, creative time period. It's very original. A lot of the music that was coming out at that time was really, you know, first time hearing this and that. And yeah, so that's a special, I'm a big Smiths fan too. Johnny Marr, you know, those guitar lines. Oh my God, forget it. Um, yeah, so, I mean, I totally identify with that stuff, but yeah, yeah, that's, it's, it's cool to, you know, that is, yeah, that's definitely one of the greatest time periods as far as I'm concerned. You yeah, know? I, I agree. Um, I agree, Jeff. That's getting definitely. to play with Tears for Fears was, that was a joy. Um, funny thing is with that, uh, I got the, the way I got the gig, I didn't even audition to play in, in the band. I was, my old band um, had been dropped from our record label, this band Wire Train. And um, and then I was looking for, you know, a gig, something to do. And I started playing on, in all these little bands and stuff like that. And then a friend of mine, Brian McLeod, uh, called me up one day and he said, hey, I got the gig playing with Tears for Fears. And I'm like, wow, congratulations. That's awesome. You know, and, so, you know, yeah. And then about a week later, he calls me up and he goes, dude, do you want to play with Tears for Fears too? <laughs> oh yeah two for one great deal you know they're look what they're getting us you know and and he goes like yeah i told the you know roland orzabal was saying hey i'd really like to get a guitar player that can sing and uh, you know sing harmonies and and um you know play other instruments and stuff like that you know it'd be nice to have somebody else and so he goes ah, i know this guy i played with them for a long time and and he had mentioned a band that I played in when I lived in London in 1990. I played in this band called World Party. And yeah, as it turns Party. out, I didn't know you played. Uh, yeah. yeah, I play on. Uh, if you look if afterwards, look a uh, message in the box, uh, the video on YouTube, and that's me with the really super long hair and the big cowboy hat. It's <laughs> like, and I'm like, you know. Still, I'm like, still a young kid and all this stuff. And um, but anyway, Roland Orsabal turns out was a big world party fan. And just based on that, I had, you know, a connection with them that I played with with World Party was okay. enough to get me the gig. So, and and so, you know, I was pleased that 
you know, hey, you know, just come over, you know, we'll we'll send you a ticket, come over. And by the way, uh, we're sending a box of all the music that you need to learn. Yeah. And I'm listening to all these songs and going, holy cow, this stuff is complicated. How am I going to figure out what part to play? It was it was overwhelming. I was I, almost, I, I was remember I remember buying some high end uh, high end stereo equipment and it was I'm, I'm gonna I don't know why I'm blanking. I said well, it was well after the hurting, but the, one of their albums, um, it was almost like like if you went in to buy high end stereo equipment or speakers, they would put Sting on or Tears for Fears songs um, from the Big Chair or something like that. After um, that, it was the oh thing. after that yeah. Uh, very, very, very like almost Sergeant Peppery like album cover. I'm blanking on the name of the album right now. Anyway, um, but oh, Seeds of Love, I think, right? Or Sun right. of the Seeds of Love. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, the, and it was complicated stuff, and and audiophiles loved showing off speakers with that stuff. Yeah, there's all these sound effects and just like it was three dimensional kind of music. Right. Yeah. You exactly. know? And we had to. There was just six of us playing. In this band, in this version of the of Tears of Fears, when I played, it was around this. Uh, Elemental was the album that I toured for. Um, yeah, Kurt, there was a was Kurt not around then? I don't think Kurt was around. He then. was he had, he had just left the band yeah. and all that stuff, and then I think. Roland was like, well, I'm going to still do Tears for Fears yeah. and I'll just do all the singing and you can do it. Yeah. He's so talented. And then rather than having like, you know, the 12 piece band, he, he just went out with like a six piece band and we had to cover so many parts. I mean, I'm virtually singing on every single song, all the backups with Gail Ann Dorsey, who went on to play um, bass and sing in David Bowie's band. So, yeah you know but uh that was that was fun i did that for you know a little little bit and you know really learned about you know how really learned you know how inadequate of a guitar player <laughs> I was at that time but i learned quick i had to like get in and just do the work you yeah know? i bet i bet you uh i bet you you know it's like playing tennis with somebody who's like way ab above your whatever i bet way... you got better over that course of time playing with them right you had to yeah i was never you know an academic kind of player i was more you know like feel and kind of vibe and kind of get the you know what the gist of the songs needed and all that stuff but this i had to be very specific and so that did help me um you know for the future of doing other things and you know of course so, but uh yeah after you have great. to do that and sing on every song and do all that stuff everything else after that is like no problem i got you Exactly. Yeah. It's just a cakewalk, you know, <laughs> but that was, you know, every single show, it was, I was worried that, you know, that, you know, at the end of the, you know, after, after show, Roland would come up to me, you know, on dog eat dog, you know, bar 64, you dropped a beat or you, you didn't play that riff right or something like that. He would like go up and like say, so he's like, I heard you missed it. It's, it's he heard everything. Stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so almost like uh, what's his the 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 harsh jazz drummer, um, uh, not Buddy Rich. You're talking Buddy about Rich. Him. Yeah, yeah, Buddy Rich. How Buddy Rich could hear every single little like thing yeah. and every flaw. Yeah, that was that was rolling. You know, just <laughs> great stories, Jeff. Great stories, man. That's uh, what a what a what a joy. I can't. I honestly can't wait to get to do this in person. It's um. It's it's off, awesome talking to you like this, and thank you so much for for sharing what you shared. You're you sound like there's a there's a there's a book in there somewhere, brother. I think there might be. Yeah, you know, it's uh, yeah, there are a lot of stories and stuff. It definitely stored away, and as long as I can keep my memory intact and keep some kind of you know how it is, it's like you know if I don't write it down, you know, you forget it. But but these things are really like well itched in my mind, so I feel like some of these things feel like, you know, it just happened yesterday. So it's nice.